All right, so let's talk about finishing cuts. First thing you want to do is to finish your spoon 90% done before you let it dry. It's going to achieve a few things. A spoon that is nice and thin and to the final shape by the time you leave it to dry is going to have less risk of cracking and it's also going to dry quicker. There's going to be less material for you to remove when you do your finishing cuts and that's going to assist you with taking light cuts and with taking your time. So having said that, how do you tell when your wood is dry enough? One simple way that I like to do it is if you hold the spoon up to your lips. If it's still wet or if it's got a high moisture content, it's going to feel cold. If it feels like it's room temperature, I usually think that it's dry enough to do the finishing cuts. Sharp tools. You really can't overstress the importance of stropping your edge when it comes to getting a good tool finish on a spoon or a cup or something else. So anytime when I'm about to take some finishing cuts on something, I'll first make sure that I'm stropping my tools as sharp as I can get them. And if I can't get them as sharp as I want by stropping, then I'm going to put a fresh edge on for when I do my finishing cuts. So if you keep your tools in good condition, then all that you will need to do is a few passes on a strop each time before you start to do those finishing cuts. And another tip is to remember to clean off the blade after you do this because you don't want your polishing compound getting on your final finished surface of your spoon. I use just the same knives for everything and that encourages me to get better about keeping them in pristine condition. People often ask me how much do I need to strop my knife? The answer is how many times until it is sharp enough. I think as a good general rule of thumb, you should aim to be doing 20 or so strokes on each side, but just check with your thumb and if your knife is easily biting in and not slipping when you give it a light pressure on your thumbnail, then it's going to be sharp enough for general work. And for finishing cuts, you want to get it just that bit sharper than that. So your wood is surface dry, your tools are sharp, now what? Well, when you want to leave a good surface finish on a spoon, the key is to take very light cuts with your very sharp tool. So let's say on the back of this spoon bowl, I just want to make tiny little curls. And can you start to see the shiny surface that's being left behind? On a spoon bowl, finishing cuts, you'll get better results if you do it when you are cutting with the grain or along the grain. Cross grain cuts just don't get that same really shiny, nice finish. When we're carving down from the top of the bowl, it's the same thing. I'm aiming to get really light cuts, nice curls. One handy thing about letting your spoons dry before you do the finishing cuts is that it should be obvious what parts of the surface you've cut and what parts you've not cut yet because you'll be able to see the oxidation difference or even just from looking at the quality of the surface finish. Sometimes I will do the whole spoon bowl by going just with the grain, but a lot of the times that's a bit too fiddly for me and I'll come around across the grain and clean up those problem areas, especially at the bottom of the bowl. In this case though, I'm going to try and practice my really tiny light cuts and see if I can get these two directions to meet in the middle without raising a little snag. Sometimes you will need to come across the grain to get these little bits here at the bottom of the bowl. I'm working with my hook knife all the way to the edge because part of my finishing process is to cut the final rim on the spoon. A good knife finish surface should be slightly reflective, should have a nice sort of gloss and a sheen to it. You can see down here in the middle where I've done those cross grain cuts and they don't have that same sort of quality to them as the areas that I cut with the grain do. When it comes to the rim of the spoon, I'm going to be taking a very tiny little cut. And with this, I'm establishing the final thickness of the rim. And remember, it's going to get a little bit thinner after I do my chamfers. So I'm taking that into account. 
on the other side. Now I just need to match the same rim that I've just cut. Being careful that the tip of my knife does not cut the other side where I don't want it to. And being cautious with this cross grain cut not to tear it out or cause a chip. You can come down from the other way. And same thing over here. As I work, I'm just checking for symmetry. When it comes to the back of the bowl, it's the same principle, but we are working with a convex curve this time. So this is when you can put in your little nice facets, or you can just do lots of tiny little cuts and approach something that's smooth and round. I'm using my knife on an angle here because the more of an angle that you present the knife to the wood, the more amount of the edge you're using to cut the same amount of wood, which is going to leave more of a slicing than a sort of pushing cut action and will leave a better finish. You should take advantage of leverage when you can. You'll notice how I'm using my thumb not only as a place to push the knife from, but as a pivot point. And using the very tip of my knife, I'm able to put a lot of control into these cuts. I'm moving the spoon rather than the knife for the most part, because I find that's what helps me have the most control. Now you've got to be careful when you're working with a thin spoon that you do not carve it too thin and carve all the way through. So you can see with mine that it's getting quite thin already. I'm able to bend it with my fingers like this. But uh, I'll just check up against a strong backlight and I can see where the light is shining through. And then I know which areas I can safely remove wood from or which areas I need to leave alone. Part of the skill of doing finishing cuts like this is knowing when to stop. So if you sort of fiddle away at it forever and ever and ever, you're very rarely going to be as satisfied as if you had quit while you were ahead or sort of accepted the spoon for, for how it was. So for doing the back and the top side of the handle, it's the same principle, but this time instead of doing lots of small fine cuts, I'm going to be trying to get one continuous cut all the way from the start to the end. I put on my budget's bib. Now lots of people worry about getting sort of nice handle facets. I don't think that's that important, but I will give you a few tips on how to get them. So for starters, your surface needs to be flat and smooth before you start trying to cut facets on it. If it's not, and there's sort of hills and valleys, it's going to be difficult for you to get the continuous cut that you need to get a smooth and even looking facet. So I'm using the tip of my knife here. I'm not really moving the knife, I'm just pulling the spoon against the blade and allowing it to cut at a nice angle.
for the top of the handle it's the same thing but the direction of the cut is going to be the opposite so I'll start at the top now as you progress through your cut I like to move from the base of the blade to the tip and that will help me getting a slicing action I'm supporting the handle with the pad of my thumb here and I'm being careful that my blade is not going to be getting in the way there. So by the time you get to the base or the neck of the handle, you want to be coming towards the very end of the tip of your knife so that you're not going to cut into the shoulders of your spoon and cause a crack. Because I've already carved the bowl to the final like thickness, which is now very thin, I've got to be careful not to put too much pressure on it when I brace it against my chest, otherwise I could break it. And I'm not making any particular effort for this handle to have well-defined facets, but they are going to arise as a consequence of the types of cuts and techniques I'm using with my knife here. Alright, so I'll clean up the sides of the handle now. I've left it a little bit thick so that I can approach the shape I want at the end. This is the time when I will try to refine the symmetry of these areas. Same thing with the sides of the bowl. In this instance, if you can get one continuous clean cut, then that's going to help you having a nice round smooth bowl and I'm using this opportunity to tidy up the rim of my bowl and to fix the shape so that it's something that I'm happy with. I'm always making little tweaks to the shape of the spoon as I go. As you go you're going to notice little mistakes that you've made and you can just fix those up. For example, I've noticed a little chip here that I didn't clean up. It's going to be tricky to get that with my open curve knife. So I'm going to switch to my more close curve hook knife and try and take out that little area. Blowing on the spoon will help to dislodge those tiny little chips and will help you see what is actually sticking up out of the surface and what is just sort of floating around. I'm now taking a moment to get the handle shape how I would like and since I've, I've now changed this shape I'll just come back here and put that nice round over back on the top. I'm just moving my knife down in a consistent way and allowing it to take off any high spots. I'll do the same on the other side. When you take out these chips, you should hear a little click. All right, so this spoon is ready for some chamfers. I will just take the lightest cut that I can whilst maintaining a constant shaving. And I'll chase that all the way down to the neck of the spoon. Sometimes you'll feel the knife sort of catch in the grain and start to take a deeper cut than you want. you just got to be cautious. Now I'll get these to meet up from the other side, starting at the top, coming down.
and I want a clean corner on this inside transition. The rest of the bowl. I can feel it taking off a little bit more than I want here, so I've decided to take off the whole rim and blend it into the chamfer. One thing you'll notice with the way I'm using my knife is I'm always maintaining multiple points of contact so that I have a very stable and very steady grip. On the back side, I only want a very tiny, fine little chamfer on this sharp corner, so I'm actually just going to scrape it with my knife, like this, and that will be enough. On this little inside corner here, we'll do a tiny little cut, and then this one can meet up with the chamfer on the back of the handle. I cut in like this, chip off the excess. And now I can chase that all the way down. And that's done. Right, so burnishing with a mixture of oil and wax, in my case I use hemp oil and beeswax that I mix together into a paste consistency, is going to really bring out the surface finish that you've just carefully cut with your knife. I like to use a natural fiber cloth for this. I think linen is the best, and I get these little linen fabric scraps from fabric suppliers that are just the right size. So I'll get a little bit of my paste, and I will vigorously rub and burnish that into the surface. Now if you plan to paint the handle or maybe roast the wood, you'll need to do that before this step, but I usually will wax my spoons straight away after I finish carving them to reduce the possibility that they get dirty in some way before I can get to it. So you can really see the shine start to come out in the wood now from that. Now the linen cloth is actually very slightly abrasive. Not enough to actually remove any wood, but enough to sort of burnish over and polish those facets and leave a really nice surface. Now if you want to take it a step further, you can get one of these brimcorn burnishes for the handle. And just make sure that you're supporting it so you're not bending it or causing it to break. And you just rub that on the surface, like so. And that's going to polish that finish. Specifically, I like this for easing over the edges, like for the uh, rim of the bowl, for example. You want a nice, smooth feeling in the mouth. For the inside of the bowl, I tend not to do that, but you can use a smooth rock to burnish it. Or you can use some polished antler or something similar. What's going on here is that the heat from the friction of the linen against the wood is causing the beeswax to melt and the oil to warm up, and that's going to assist it to penetrate into the wood surface. And now you just need to let that dry until the oil has cured, which can be as quick as a few days or can take as long as a few weeks, depending on the weather.